Dr. Dietrich Steffen is recognized as a pioneer in the field of precision medicine. He trained with the leadership of the Human Genome Project at the NIH. Uh, He went on to lead discovery research at the Translational Genomics Research Institute and served as professor and chairman of the Department of Human Genetics at the University of Pittsburgh. He's identified the molecular basis of dozens of genetic diseases, and he's published extensively in journals such as Science, the New England Journal of Medicine, Nature Genetics, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and Cell. He's also an entrepreneur, having founded some, founded or co-founded some 14 biotech companies. And today he's joining me on the business of biotech. Dr. Stefan, it's great to see you again. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. We're honored to have you. Uh, and I, and I want to talk about some some common ground before we kind of get into the meat of the interview. I wanted to talk about Pittsburgh for a minute. So um, I live a, a few counties uh, north of you up in up in Crawford County, and, and we have offices here in Erie, so not too far at all. And I, I find it a, a bit intriguing about you. You're a Pittsburgh native. Uh, you've stayed there for your, your you stayed there for your studies at Carnegie Mellon uh, and the University of Pittsburgh. I love the fact that you still rep uh, Shady Side Academy on your LinkedIn profile, um, and now you've built your business there. Uh, so, tell me a bit about why that is. Why not, you know, Boston? Why not San Francisco? Why did you stay kind of, kind of rooted uh, where you where you were planted? That's a great question. You know, I've um, obviously uh, been born and raised in Pittsburgh. Uh, but then over the course of my career, have had the pleasure of working in the DC area, Phoenix, where we helped build a biocluster from scratch, Boston and San Francisco. And so have had exposure and work experience in all of the major biotech hubs in the US. And when I was looking to create, um, you know, the, place uh, which could fuel healthcare solutions for the future. I actually did an analysis of um, all of the geographies in the US and tried to understand where in the country uh, were the necessary ingredients uh, to spawn those types of transformational solutions. And so interestingly, um, after Boston and San Francisco, Pittsburgh was number three in terms of its innovation base. Um, And for those of you who are not familiar with Pittsburgh, uh, the University of Pittsburgh is fifth in NIH funding for life sciences research, uh, transplant technology, uh, the polio vaccine, and a number of um, significant healthcare contributions came out of that institution. And then abutting that campus is Carnegie Mellon University, which is uh, arguably the top computer science uh, school in the in the world. It's the birthplace of machine learning and so forth. And so when you blend those innovation assets and you collide them, you have the makings for solutions that leverage compute, nanotechnology, and life sciences. And that's precisely the blend that that will dominate those solutions. And so I actually wrote a Harvard Business Review article on this published in 2012, uh, if you're interested in that. Um, But then uh, very quickly thereafter moved to Pittsburgh and uh, established a framework uh, to extract that innovation uh, from the universities and drive it into uh, the private sector. And that that framework uh, is, is does that uh, include LifeX Labs? You're, you you founded LifeX Labs in, in in Pittsburgh. Was that sort of the the key element of that framework? Yeah. So the culmination of that exercise, if you will, it was uh, to build the necessary infrastructure in Pittsburgh to actually translate that innovation into the marketplace. And so, what that comprised was building. Uh, a place or the hub uh, where entrepreneurs, investors, and uh, business people could come together and exchange ideas and nucleate new company formation. And so that's the LifeX platform. Um, It's comprised of an incubator accelerator, uh, uh, which can house nascent companies. Uh, It brings uh, leaders and service providers around those entrepreneurs. So they have a support network 
uh, brings capital around them. Uh, and so uh, together with that, we launched uh, a seed fund uh, that can capitalize those early stage companies. And we've had several companies now mature uh, and find their legs and um, and move on to become significant players. And, and actually New Base is one of those companies. Awesome. I, uh, you know, pre-COVID, I, I, as I said, I'm not too far from Pittsburgh. So I, I enjoyed traveling down there to a couple of LifeX events. Um, I saw a speaker from 5AM Ventures, I think was the, the last event I was down there. It was, you know, focused on uh, fundraising for, for startup biotechs. Um, great events. Well, you know, well, well done, very well done. Great organization, great people. I, uh, I, I, I grow concerned, you know, as, as this disruption that, that we're facing uh, carries on, I grow concerned for communal organizations like that, that have such an important mission, um, yet are kind of, you know, really affected by, uh, by this disruption. Do you, are you, are you still connected with LifeX? And, uh, you know, do, do you think that the, the organization is going to be able to kind of weather this uh, virtual storm that we're facing? You know, I handed off the leadership uh, to some folks who I believe are competent to take the organization to the next level. These types of organizations that fall in uh, sort of the translational divide uh, or the valley between academia and industry are always difficult uh, because there is no one stakeholder who feels compelled to own and, 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 and really drive it to success. And so it's constantly trying to communicate with various stakeholders what the value is, uh, and really the value is in the mid to long term and creating a robust ecosystem like we see in the Boston or San Francisco area. And so I hope they're, um, you know, still uh, pushing hard and um, uh, there will always be a, a need for healthcare solutions. And it would be a tragedy uh, to see the tremendous innovation here in this region uh, not be supported by that organization uh, due to uh, you know, the macro environment that we're faced with right now. Yeah. That, uh, that translational divide is a, is a great segue. Thank you for that. I should just turn over hosting duties to you, uh, to, to the next question I had, uh, which is around your transition from academia to industry. You, um, have a, a storied career in, in academia. You had, I mean, it, you know, continue to, uh, you know, uh, you've made, made a lot of contributions there, a lot of pro contributed to a lot of progress. What, um, what sort of inspired the transition to go on to found some 14 uh, biotech startups? Yeah, so it's all about impact for me. Uh, everything is keyed off of impact. And so I first went into academia uh, because the promise of sequencing the human genome and providing that framework uh, to be able to allow patients and their physicians to understand sort of the root cause of a person's disease uh, felt like it was the most significant thing that I could contribute to at the time. And so that was great work done by the NIH and Solera together, uh, culminating in the draft sequences in 2001, and then continued my academic work um, you know, in my early 30s as chair of the um, neurogenomics a group at TGen and ultimately running all of research at TGen, which encompassed 13 divisions across various disease areas. And, and the mission there uh, was very simply to sift through the molecular makeup of people with and without diseases using all of the incredible machinery that had been co-developed uh, with the draft sequence um, and map those differences uh, against a, a normal genome, basically, to find out what was causing a wide number of diseases at the molecular level. And, and that led to um, you know, a multitude of molecular diagnostics being pushed out uh, that patients could avail themselves, uh, including some national diagnostics infrastructure that we helped catalyze in the mid 2000s. And so uh, felt like that was worthwhile. And, um, uh, but ultimately as an academician, uh, your job is to um, uh, get grants and write papers and hope someone picks up the ball and runs with it uh, towards patient impact. And even though we were supported with a translational infrastructure at TGen, um, you know, the, the steady even hand uh, in chaperoning those innovations into the marketplace was, was often not present. And so you'd 
put mm-hmm. a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into figuring something out that could be transformational only to have someone else drop the ball. And so that really is what led me to extend or, or be interested in extending my personal reach into uh, being connected to these biotech companies, usually at the board level to help chaperone things forward, and ultimately um, to move completely into uh, the for-profit sector, uh, where I think um, you know direct impact is is absolutely uh, our mission. Yeah, yeah. Has there been uh, as as you look at the the biotechs that you um, that you involve yourself with? Have there been common common threads, themes that, uh, that that you're attracted to among those companies? Yes, um, that's a great question, and and um, you know it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, over the course of you know 14 plus companies, a, the, a, a a boilerplate has emerged, and and that boilerplate is usually the idea is discounted uh, outright or. Uh, laughed at when we first put it together and start pitching it uh, to uh, our colleagues in the venture capital community. Um, But once we get it capitalized and out of the box, they generally become first in class companies. And so just a couple examples, Um, Navigenics was really the first and most rigorous personal genomics company where we could take a saliva sample from someone sift through the genome and give them uh, a report back on their desktop about their hardwired genetic risk factors. It wasn't map your genome against a movie star or some of the fun and frivolous things out there. Um, So deep thinking went into that. And um, and there are a number of companies now that um, are following uh, and drafting off of that work. Uh, There was a company named Pendulum Therapeutics, which is um, arguably, um, if not the leader, one of the leaders in the microbiome space. And when we first started pitching this on Sand Hill Road, uh, people had no, you know, literally it was like, what, you're going to sequence the gut biome and do what? And and now we know that the biome is correlated to everything and literally every disease, Um, you know, liquid biopsies and oncology. new base in the precision medicine space and so forth. And so I think that's the theme and and it's really keyed off of just going deep on the science and suspending disbelief early on and imagining uh, the potential, um, you know, pressure testing it over and over again until we we become convinced. And then just having the confidence uh, to push through all of the naysayers and and sort of give birth to these things. Um, So, it's a lot of fun from a process perspective, um, uh, uh, but um, there's also, um, you know, significant uh, work to be done after giving birth to them in terms of managing them to uh, to success. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, and 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 uh, and, and the the tools that you have to do this are, are constantly changing and evolving. And I want to want to spend some time talking about those tools. Um, you know, when we last spoke back in September, I believe, of 2020. Uh, we, we talked about the role that computing power and big data, data analytics are playing in the development of designer therapies. And I, I want to dig into that. But first, before we kind of get into some specific questions around that, I want to get I just want to get your perspective. You know, you, you came out of uh, you came out of um, uh, your Ph.D. in human genetics back in uh, the mid 90s, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Just, just give us some perspective on in, you know, specific to, to your area of expertise and study. What's what's changed from a com- computational power standpoint from from then to now? I mean, sure. a, and I, <laughs> Dietrich, I know that's a giant question. <laughs> you could go. No, on. not at all. Not at all. Yeah, I just, mean, I, it's a great question. I mean, I can remember in grad school, um, you know, very few people had cell phones. Um, laptops were these huge clunky machines. There was no Google. Um, you know, this was in the early '90s. And, um, you know, it's hard to even imagine getting anything. Email was, you know, uh, plain text editors. Um, and it's very hard to imagine. It's, Im- it's impossible uh, to do the things that we're doing today had the compute and storage infrastructure not come alongside uh, the human genetics push. Um, they had to mature 
uh, in parallel. Um, and we're lucky that they did. Otherwise, we would be completely hamstrung in terms of making use of the draft sequence and all of these multi-omics data sets and so forth. And so um, I don't know if that's that's the answer to your question, but it's just a, sort of a stark juxtaposition in, in a few, few short years. Yeah, it, it really is. And I think it, uh, you know, it, it's, it's funny for the folks of our age to reminisce a little bit, but I think it's probably pretty jarring for uh, those younger among our audience to hear that, you know, so I, I graduated from high school in 93. I went uh, my, my first semester on campus in 94. If you wanted to, if I wanted to send you an email at the time, Dietrich, I had to walk to the computer lab to send you an email. And it was a very cum cumbersome hit return at the end of every line sort of experience. Yes. But that is, that is pretty jarring for the, the younger among us to hear. But um, so, so as it relates to uh, the technology that you're using in, in, your, in, your, in your day job now, uh, what, what kind of, let's, let's talk about the data. What kind of data is valuable to the work you're doing at, at new base? Sure, absolutely. And maybe just to preface my answer, um, you know, we are really in the midst of a fundamental transformation in the pharmaceutical industry. And you and I have talked about this in the past, um, you know, before you would take um, some cells or tissues and dump literally hundreds of thousands of random chemicals onto them and hope that a couple of them stick and do what you want them to do in terms of making the disease a little bit better. And you, you had no idea really what, what they were sticking to or how they were sticking to it. And then you'd go on this decade long, multi-billion dollar chemical engineering escapade with a very low success rate um, to find one drug. And that's why we still have so many diseases out there that are untreatable and why drug prices are so high because we in the pharma industry have to recoup all of those investments uh, into a very time consuming um, and, and sort of tedious process. And so that's the, that's the past, that's the pharma industry of the past. The future, um, and there are a small group of companies that are paving the way, Nubase being one of them, is going upstream of cells and proteins to DNA and RNA and saying, okay, well, we know every disease has a genetic component. Um, so either you inherit a variant from one of your parents or you acquire one someone in your, some, somewhere in your lifetime that causes a dysfunctional protein and manifests in disease. So now that we understand the genetic drivers of the vast majority of human diseases, Rather than throwing random chemicals at cells or proteins, we can tweak and tune genes at the DNA and RNA level so they never form dysfunctional proteins and dysfunctional cells. Um, but in order to do that, uh, specifically answering your question, we need a computer that houses all 6 billion letters of the diploid genome. Um, we need a database of all of the mutations that have ever been found in the human population heretofore. Um, we need to be able to look at causative genes. Let's say in our case, we're working to cure myotonic dystrophy and brain disorders and cancers. We need to find those genes. And then we need to, you know, using computational technologies, tile across those genes to find regions that we can target and then map those regions against the entire rest of the genome and transcriptome to make sure they're unique. Um, and then we start screening and we screen thousands of short pieces, what look like short pieces of DNA or RNA called oligonucleotides across different cells and get quantitative data out, and then that needs to be processed to optimize and so forth. And so a long way of saying, you know, compute and storage technology, the trillions of dollars that have been invested over the last decades in that infrastructure is being used to fuel this transformation in the pharmaceutical industry that's keyed off of digital data and quantitative data uh, and there's no way that we could make sense of that data uh, but for the compute infrastructure. And by the way, that's one of the benefits of being here in Pittsburgh and in the center of um, 
you know, machine learning uh, to be able to access some of the fastest supercomputers in the world at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center and so forth. Yeah. How would you characterize, um, this, this question might best be answered sort of, sort of by segment or, or size of, of, of pharma, but how would you, and maybe, maybe not, uh, how, how, how would you characterize the acceptance or adoption of co- compute power, you know, of, of data analytics and machine learning, as opposed to sort of that historic, you know, lab coat, wet lab sort of uh, trial and error approach. I love the the way that you described the. I wrote this down: decades long uh, chemical engineering escapade. It was very, <laughs> very, very, very descriptive. Um, so, so how would you sort of characterize the acceptance level of you know da- data scientists in the space um, as as opposed to sort of the the, the, the historic uh, wet lab approach? Yeah, I think um, today uh, the acceptance is in full force, uh, sort of coalescing around our ability to target nature's digital information encoding schema, A, C's, G's, and T's, mm-hmm. that stretch for you know billions of letters long. It's 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 fundamental, and and so we're pulling in bioinformatics and data scientists um, fully. Uh, that being said, I I think that type of data element is is essential in order to be able to engage them and fully. So while I think there's a place in high throughput screening and sort of traditional SAR work with small molecules for machine learning um, uh, 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 sort of activities, I, I, I don't think it fully utilizes the power of of compute technologies uh, because there's simply not a lot of, there's not enough attributes to feed into the machine across large enough data sets to fully leverage those capabilities. And so again, just to give you a sense of this, I mean, there are billions of letters in the genome and transcriptome. There are um, thousands or tens of thousands of mutations that are known every every 50 hours we can churn out you know, hundreds of new drugs, screen them over the course of a week, put them in a machine, optimize and iterate. Um, And so the data sets become very large, but they're all quantifiable. Mm -hmm. They're at the genetic sequence level or in quantitative outputs so that you can really feed them into a machine. Um, So it's, I think, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see these two fields fully collide um, at this uh, inflection point in, in pharma. And, and it's been also fascinating, just as an aside, seeing big pharma or the, or the pharma um, um, of, of yesteryear, if you will. I, I feel like I'm being un, un, unduly, um, uh, me, uh, you know, um, unkind to my colleagues, but I'm, I'm trying to make a point. I'm not trying to, yeah. anyone's doing anything wrong. It's been really interesting seeing the realization on the part of big pharma that there are these tiny disruptive precision genetic medicine plays that really promise scalable outputs going forward using these new strategies and see them fully engaging and sort of partnering or acquiring them uh, in in big transactions at at almost a month. Yeah. Yeah. The business of biotech is brought to you in partnership with Cytiva. Together, we're committed to helping the leaders of new and emerging biopharma companies navigate the financial, organizational, human resources, and regulatory waters you'll encounter on your way from discovery to the clinic and beyond. Check out a host of useful resources for biotech leaders at Cytiva's Emerging Biotech Accelerator at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A lifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. And, and, and I think that's the, that, that's the, uh, you, you articulated it better than, than I attempted to. That's where I was going with sort of the, perhaps the question is best answered, answered by segment, because I, you know, it occurs to me that a company like Newbase is agile and, and, you know, nimble as, as you might be, uh, might, might be better positioned to uh, take advantage of, of some of this, um, you know, 
some 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 of this the, the power of of computational um, uh, data analysis and, and machine learning uh, to to move this forward as opposed to you know you you don't have that kind of big that big structure to to navigate uh, to to be able to do it so. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these, I mean, so a lot of these technologies are um, being, um, I like to say we're, we're constantly in uh, design build mode, uh, which is sort of an architectural reference, which is we know we're, we know we're building a house, we know it went, we want it to look generally like this. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't quite know exactly, you know, which, which brick goes where yet. Um, uh, but we're pushing the go button because we we know we're going to get a house at the end. We know it's going to be beautiful, uh, but we're problem solving uh, constantly. And so speaking to your question of nimbleness, uh, absolutely, on almost a daily basis, we're either pulling new people in, um, optimizing strategies, remaking drugs, um, you know, pulling in different types of uh, delivery technology alongside that and so forth. And so it's uh, it's a lot of fun, um, and it's exactly what you would imagine uh, uh, it, it looks and feels like in a, in a small uh, sort of, um, you know, company that has the potential to be disruptive. Yeah. So I want to I want to kind of put some of this theoretical conversation into into um, an illustration of uh, machine learning and, and big data in practice at, at New Base. And that'll give us an opportunity to talk a little bit about your platform as well. So. You know, maybe maybe the question is this: um, If you look at uh, your, your company at its current state of, of, of maturation, right where you are uh, as we stand today, can you share uh, any uh, success stories? Maybe you know, even even if it's a sort of a, a small, like uh, you know, a, a story that um, builds hope for future success, but success stories that you've experienced so far as a result of your ability to, you know, power through the, this kind of data? Yeah, so um, yes. So I think it's worth juxtaposing it again uh, uh, against kind of a generalization of how we used to do business, um, which is high throughput trial and error screening followed by um, structure activity relationship, chemical engineering that um, could, you know, generally people say is sort of a decade long, multi-billion dollar process to get a drug out the back end, uh, a drug that targets what you want it to target and doesn't have enough off-target engagement to, um, to hinder approval. And, and, and I say that very carefully because almost every drug we have on the market that's come out of that process has side effects and they're on the label and you hear them on the TV ads. And mm -hmm. that's because you don't have precise engagement. Um, you've got the drug sticking to other things and you can't anticipate that a priori and you only know it once you've gone all the way through a phase three trial or even sometimes on market with phase four monitoring that some, you know, Viox is the perfect example of that. Um, albeit with a slight twist that was on target engagement uh, of something that you didn't want it to stick to. So, mm -hmm. so what we have done internally is decide, uh, okay, we're gonna go after this handful of diseases. Um, we can log on to public databases and find the sequence of the genes that cause those diseases and you know, in the in the course of an hour or two, develop a set of drugs that match and complement the sequence of the gene we want to turn off that's misbehaving. Uh, this is through complementary base pairing. So C's stick to G's, A's stick to T's. And so we can program in the sequence of a drug into a short scaffold. And then we say, okay, well, Will this drug have any off-target engagement anywhere else in the genome, in any of the six billion letters or in any of the transcribed genes? And so we can, again, using public access tools, uh, load that sequence of the drug or the sequence of hundreds of drugs into the computer, push a button, and a minute later, uh, the computer will tell us if there are any sequences whatsoever uh, elsewhere that our drug will engage with, period. 
And then we can say, all right, well, let's get rid of those um, drugs because we know in advance that they're probably gonna cause some side effects as we move them through the pipeline. And so right there within the course of, I'd say, call it you know, a morning uh, of work, mm -hmm. we have cut out a massive amount of downstream work in um, engineering out off-target engagement in wasted money around safety and efficacy clinical trials and so forth. We have confidence. Not only that, but we know what the most closely related sequences are that our drug could engage with. So we know, let's, let's just use an example, perfect engagement with our target gene but it has, let's say, 80% match at the sequence level with some other gene out there. And we believe that it won't shut that gene off. But what we can do is, now that we know that it's that gene that we might be tickling, at the very earliest stages of development, we simply measure in the lab whether we're getting targeting off-target engagement. And if we are, we can retire that compound. So again, we because we now know what we're looking for, we can be much more prescient and, and, and observant in seeing if we're, we're getting the faintest hints of off-target engagement and pivot the development program. And, and it's hard to quantify from a monetary and time perspective, the amount of savings that that type of compute exercise facilitates Mm -hmm. But I could argue that it could be measured in years and billions of dollars of cost savings. And there's real evidence for that. There, there's evidence that companies in our little cohort are increasing the cadence of output of drugs. They're being produced faster and more efficiently because of exercises like the one I just described. Yeah. And, and importantly, uh, I, I would I would venture a guess that much of that savings comes from the point you made about being able to fail fast, right? Like you you're not wasting time and and, and resources on um, you know on 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 but on on candidates that just don't have don't have a future. The, the earlier you know there's no there, there's no opportunity there, the, the better. Exactly, absolutely, uh, and it's interesting. I mean, from a public markets perspective, it's. Um, you know, it's fascinating because failing faster, uh, I'm not sure has been baked into the mindset of um, the publicly traded, mon you know, biotech mantra. Um, it's all about um, what successes uh, are you reporting on on a quarterly basis versus, versus um, sort of how many things are you retiring uh, because you've gotten smarter, faster. And, and and that's an interesting early conundrum here with this cadre of companies. Well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 problematic and it, 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 it flies in the face of reality, right? I mean, what what's the, I don't know, what is the the, the, the number that gets bandied around uh, the percentage of, of candidates that, that ultimately fail? I mean, pick, pick your number, right? But 90%, 99%, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, if, if that's the reality, you know, why haven't we embraced this idea that kicking some of these ideas to the curb quickly is is uh, increasing company valuation, right? Like that's a good thing. I would argue it is, um, yeah. it, but it has to be clearly articulated. And, and I think that that's a challenge for little companies uh, like ours that are at the, yeah. at the forefront of this wave. I think another concept that you raised that's interesting and important is that the success rates should be much higher mm -hmm. overall because of what we just discussed. I mean, you know exactly what you're targeting and exactly whether it's gonna stick somewhere else or not. And because of that, um, you know, you, you should be able to drive it uh, forward with a higher success rate and, um, and do so in, in more of a parallelized fashion. And I think we're starting to see the earlier, earliest hints of that. Um, and if you play that out, ultimately, what it manifests itself in is higher impact out there in the market. I think a lot of these genetic, so quick aside, 10% of disease burden globally is single gene monogenic genetic disorders, 
50% of us will be touched by cancer, which is a genetic disease of a single cell. 10% of us will, you know, die of an infectious disease. And that's, you know, right, you know, in our faces uh, at this current moment. And then you've got common chronic diseases, which will touch all of us that all have genetic drivers. So uh, the vast majority of cancers and purely genetic diseases have no effective therapies at this point in time, however you wanna measure them. And so I think strategies like the ones we're talking about where the hit rate should go up one or two orders of magnitude by being intelligent and knowing what you're targeting and parallelizing does, I fundamentally believe, promise a very bright future uh, for many of these intractable diseases. And quite frankly, it should drive out costs from therapeutic development programs, which don't necessarily have to be recouped in the marketplace post hoc. So I think it's all very fascinating. Um, and I think um, you know the next couple decades are gonna be really great. Um, from an impact perspective, yeah, and I I know we didn't didn't name it per se, but th this uh, what you've described is effectively a new bases patrol platform. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Just wanted to make sure we we got that in there. Uh, what's what's in the in the name, by the way? The, the P A. It's capital P A T small R capital O L. Is that is there uh, some meaning behind that? Yes. Yes. That is an abbreviation. Uh, for the chemistry, uh, that's a little bit of a mouthful, that forms our scaffold, mm -hmm. our nucleobases, and our delivery technology all wrapped up together. And so envision it as a set of Lego blocks that can be snapped together. Uh, and so what PATROL stands for is peptide, nucleic, acid, oligotherapies. Um, and Peptide nucleic acids um, are a, um, a scaffold uh, technology uh, into which we plug our nucleobases, our ACs, Gs, and Ts. And so think of that, uh, the ACs, Gs, and Ts as um, the heat-seeking part of a heat-seeking missile mm -hmm. and the scaffold being the missile uh, itself. And... Uh, the reason that that scaffold is so critically important to success of for, uh, uh, related to the vision that we've been talking about is that it's um, a polyamide scaffold, which is biologically inert, meaning the body can't see or recognize it. So there's no immune response formed against it, um, neither innate nor acquired. Um, you know, there's uh, little uh, to no toxicities from accumulation of the scaffold in various organs. Um, it's actually quite similar to nylon, uh, which if you think about it, has been used in patients in surgical applications for decades and it, it's simply not recognizable. And so um, in addition, that scaffold provides a boost to the precision of engagement of the nucleobases to the target. These drugs don't like mismatches uh, between the sequence that's programmed in and the target gene of interest. So even a single base or two mismatch, the drug doesn't like to engage and it'll pop off. Um, there are other technical attributes that we believe make this superior to first generation scaffolds, um, but Patrol is sort of an all-encompassing acronym to to all of those bits and pieces. Yeah, no, it's tidy and fitting. Uh, I want to I want to touch uh, on your uh, pipeline. Uh, we're mm -hmm. running short on time. I want to give you an opportunity to give us an update on your pipeline. But real quick, be before I do that, I've got one more question for you related to compute technology. Um, I, I'm assuming that much of the t the compute technology that Newbase uses is uh, proprietary, probably built on, I don't know, maybe AWS and some, some you know, accessible technology, but the actual, you know, tech that you guys are using, I'm, I'm assuming is proprietary. Is that a safe assumption? Like, uh, Actually not. All of oh, the, okay. all all right. of the compute uh, technology that we use is open source. All of the databases, all of the algorithms, um, 
you know, that that has matured to such a level that it's simply sort of plugging in the, the modules that you want and and doing the work that you need to do. Um, okay. And that's largely commoditized out there in the world. So what we so, for example, there are all kinds of classifiers you know, random forest classifier, whatever you need that you can simply download and apply to your data set. I think what is proprietary to us is the core technology platform. And then the know-how encompassed by our team in harnessing the nuances of that technology to cure diseases. Um, okay. So that's the way we think about it. Yeah. All right. And I was, I guess, where I was going with that is I'm, I'm curious about your uh, anticipation of there being a, a super high tech uh, market of of applications, software applications for drug discovery companies, for instance, uh, that, that leverage these volumes of, of data and sort of give companies like yours, some plug and play attributes around finding matches, you know, finding, uh, you know, mismatches. D- do you see that coming down the pike or is that, is that not a, is, is, is that not, not likely to happen? I do see it coming down the pipe. I, I think that, um, you know, for people that know how to use these tools in their raw form, they're all out there as freeware right now. And, um, you know, if you have a couple of PhD bioinformaticians, you can do everything you need to do. Um, there are proprietary databases, though, uh, that often you have to pay to access variant databases or expression databases. Um, and there are companies that are wrapping these algorithms up and letting them run on those databases in it, sort of tied up with a pretty bow. And those are uh, subscription-based services. And so companies like Kyogen, for example, have big suites of applications such as what you're describing that pharma can tap into for a subscription and very, very elegant, very useful. Mm-hmm. Um, but we tend to like to just do things in-house. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank you for uh, entertaining my my rambling question set. Uh, so so let's catch up on, on your pipeline. You've uh, referenced a couple of times the indications uh, that new base um, targets. Let, let, let's talk about those. What, what indications are you targeting and why? Yeah, so, so ultimately we believe that our company and our technology have the potential for very broad impact across literally thousands of different diseases given every disease is genetic. So that's the future we envision for the company. Um, we fully intend to become one of uh, the dominant companies in this new world. Um, uh, But you have to start somewhere. And and we're only about a year and a half old as a company. We um, obviously are publicly traded on NASDAQ under the NBSC ticker. And we have decided to go after a few diseases that mesh with the sweet spots of our technology. Um, So largely single gene disorders um, and oncology targets. Uh, the two diseases that we've disclosed so far that we're working on are Huntington's disease, um, affects about six per 100,000 in the US and the EU. Uh, it's a dominant genetic disease. Uh, people generally die in their 50s and half their kids are affected. and. Uh, it devas- it's devastating and there's no cure. Um, um, we believe that we can neutralize that misbehaving gene before it forms a misbehaving protein. And given the attributes of our technology in terms of the biologically inertness, uh, inert profile of it, we hope to be able to give that, uh, that therapy to people who don't yet have the disease. They have the mutation, they inherited it from mom or dad, but they're a decade before symptom onset. So why would you wanna do that? Um, You would wanna do that to get ahead of the brain death that the patients ultimately succumb to because once you have brain death, you can't regrow the brain. Um, And you can only do that with an easy to take and and safe, well-tolerated therapy. So that's the holy grail for Huntington's that we're driving towards. Myotonic dystrophy is an equally as prevalent disease. Uh, It affects skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and the central nervous system, dominantly inherited, no known effective therapeutics. 
and um, we believe uh, that we have, um, you know, an exciting um, therapy uh, that will resolve the trait um, that we'll move into first in human trials uh, soon. So um, behind that, we have a number of other diseases that we're working on um, that we haven't yet announced yet. Um, but we, uh, we will start to begin talking about that in the months to come. Awesome. What's, uh, what's the, the next big step or next big challenge for Newbase to overcome? It's a good question. Um, we feel like we're on track uh, with um, our programs and, uh, you know, um, building the plane while we were flying it. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I do believe that any first-in-class platform technology or therapeutic modality uh, has a little bit of a higher hurdle to get over than things that have already been in humans over and over again. So just, you know, referencing some examples, um, you know, monoclonal antibody therapies, the first one was probably a bear to get into market and approved. And now everyone believes that monoclonal antibodies work and um, there's a clear path to um, making them and getting them approved and so forth. And so we're right in the middle of that. I don't really envision it being um, overly tedious, uh, but that's, you know, that's the going slow to go fast period that we're in right now with our first two programs. Mm -hmm. um, we do believe we'll be in humans um, at the end of next year. And after the phase one A, B readouts, um, we believe we can accelerate given we're essentially using the same scaffold over and over and over and over again. So proving that it's safe and effective in humans the first time will unlock this scalability that we um, believe is, is, uh, is, is inherent in the whole strategy and, and technology. Beautiful. Well, thank you for spending some time with us, Dr. Stuff, and I appreciate it. Um, it's always a pleasure talking with you. I, I really enjoy it. I enjoy the way that you can uh, you can articulate uh, a very complicated and complex topic. Um, You're so very kind. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure to speak with you as well and and um, look forward to our future conversations. Yeah, once uh, once we get the all clear, given the fact that we're geographically, you know, pr pretty close to one another, we'll, we'll make a point to do it in person. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. So that's Dr. Dietrich Steffen. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. Uh, I want to remind you that if you want to learn more about uh, Dr. Steffen and uh, Newbase, that's N-E-U-B-A-S-E, -E, you can go to bioprocessonline.com and read an interview that I did with Dr. Steffen uh, back in September 2020. Um, I also want to remind you that we're sponsored by Cytiva Life Sciences, uh, who's committed to the startup bioprocess space. Um, you can uh, learn more about Cytiva's commitment to the startup life sciences space by visiting them at citivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. In the meantime, I'm Matt Piller. This is the Business of Biotech, and we'll catch you next time.